I bring you greetings this evening in the name of Jesus. It is a joy to be here. It's good to see uh, uh, oh, uh, not old friends, uh, old uh, people from long ago that I knew long ago. Let's say it that way. Um, <clears throat> and yes, the congregation is very different from what it was 30 years ago. Um, and yet, uh, one of the joys of uh, being God's people is that we have um, this, this drawing together around somebody who's greater than we are. And so, uh, we do find just a lot of joy in our interactions with each other, but it is actually because uh, God has brought us into his family and we have this common uh, yearning to know him and walk with him. Uh, he's made us alive in his son. And uh, so we, uh, we have this, this common family blood. And uh, that's, that's really what makes our interactions meaningful. I uh, have appreciated already being here. We had some prayer time ahead of the service and <clears throat> uh, would encourage you to uh, continue to pray. Uh, I will tell you just up front here, uh, I depend on the Lord uh, in an assignment like this. Uh, even if I've taught it before, uh, that really is uh, that we still depend on the Lord. And uh, for, for a number of reasons uh, here, I just want to say that uh, I can prepare outlines. Uh, I can uh, project them and, and so on. But the, the real work in our hearts is a work that is done by God's Spirit, by, uh, beyond us. And so we do pray, uh, pray recognizing that there's so much about what God asks us to do that we are helpless, actually, and we're, we're depending on him. I certainly am and invite you to pray. Uh, it is, um, we are very grateful uh, for being here. Um, as I get older, I think, uh, especially come to appreciate more the safety and travel and God has been good to us, uh, drove through rain a good bit of the way, uh, but it was um, it's good to be here. The subject that we're going to be looking at is the subject of relationships. And when I think about relationships, particularly in our time, uh, I recognize something that has not necessarily shifted through the years. There is a deep human yearning for connection. That, that's, a, that's how God has made us. And we live in a time, however, in which it seems like a number of things are accenting that need in people's lives. Uh, I've, I read, um, I can't remember the exact statistic uh, recently, that uh, the number of people in our culture today who, who can't name one close friend. It's just amazing how much loneliness there is. And we're especially surprised by the loneliness in our culture because of all the connectivity. Uh, we've got, phone, we carry our phones today. Those of you who are my age, you know good and well, longer ago, we didn't have phones on the job. We didn't, and you know, now if, if my wife can't get a hold of me, she gets irritated. Like, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that perhaps, but... Uh, we just have come to expect that we can connect with people. Uh, there's their phones, there's uh, internet, there's social media, and, and so there's so much, it seems like so much connection, but it's coupled with an incredible amount of loneliness. And um, as, I, as I think about uh, our culture, somebody else actually shared this with me, is not original with me, that that the deepest pain in our culture today, the things that trouble people the most, more than anything else, is relationships. That's, that's where the pain is. Now, you know, I haven't interacted with you folks much, other than Lyle and uh, Cammie a bit, but haven't really interacted with you, so I don't know, I don't know uh, your relationships specifically, but I know, given a crowd like this, that there are people here tonight who
who are carrying pain in their heart because of some things that happened or didn't happen in relationships. As I have interacted with people, I remember years ago when I first started uh, helping uh, married uh, couples, it would have been when we lived in northern Minnesota, and I was not, uh, it was not people in our church, it was just, it was people in our community, and uh, I didn't put a sign out, uh, but there, we had people in our congregation who were reaching out to their neighbors, and they'd, they'd come and they'd say, this, these people need help, and so uh, they'd ask them if they would talk with me, and I began meeting with uh, these people, and then they said, Remember one of the first ones, they said, hey, we, our neighbors need help. Uh, we, can hear the, we can hear them from our house. And so you need, and I said, well, do they want help? And they said, I, the guy said, I'll check. He was a very bold man. And um, anyway, he called me back and said, yeah, they'll talk to you. And um, met with them a bit. And they said, hey, down the four houses down, we've got some friends and they're having trouble. And and it, it just kind of went from one to the other. And I started thinking, is every marriage in this town a wreck? Like, uh, and, and, and then something that hit me was, you know, I, I'm acquainted with a few. God sees it all. And I wondered, you know, just we could think of it even right here. You think about, uh, we're not in a very populated area right here, but just think 10 miles around. I wonder how many tears there were in the last 24 hours because of relationships, the struggles. Now, relationships are not the only cause for, for tears. There, we face trouble, we face losses, we face diagnoses, we face a variety of things, but but relationships are, are, they mean something to us and we care about it. We're not comfortable when there is conflict, when there is, uh, when there is anger and when there are walls that are raised and there is distance and, and people won't, won't uh, meet with each other. I remember uh, one of those couples that I was working with, they, they told us uh, it was a really an extended family problem and and uh, I won't go into that story tonight, but they, they told us, they said, uh, if, if uh, one of the in-laws, if, if we drive into the driveway of our parents and there's a car from another one in there, we turn around and leave. It's like they, they were just not getting along. And I guarantee you there's pain with that kind of, that kind of friction, that kind of conflict. I'd like to look at a quote here from, sorry, I need to turn this on. There we go. A quote from a man by the um, name of Harold Freer in his book, Two or Three Together. He says, what is our most imperative need? It is the need for relatedness, the need to love. We are lonely for ourselves, for our neighbors, and for our God. Our unhappy behavior roots in our ability to love. By love, we mean a capacity for the experience of concern, responsibility, respect, and understanding of other persons, as well as an intense desire for the growth of the other person. That we must be brethren is the fundamental law of our being. Now, I don't know. Uh, what you think of that. Uh, is, our, is love our most imperative need? The last sentence, that we must be brethren, is the fundamental law of our being. Well, I wonder if Harold Freer here in his book isn't a little bit like preachers that, you know, whatever subject we're preaching on is the most important subject, right? And uh, so uh, I would probably change the wording of the last sentence. And I would just change the article there. Uh, that we must be brethren is a fundamental. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that it may not be the fundamental. I'll come to that a little later here uh, uh, this evening. But it is a fundamental law of our being. We yearn for closeness. We yearn for relationships that are deep and rich. And when we don't have them, we're lonely. 
we're frustrated, we're empty. I'd like to talk about three relationships uh, this evening. Obviously, we are looking at interpersonal relationships, so we think about relationships with others, okay? And uh, before, we, before we actually look at this, relationships with others, I want you to think about your own relationships and maybe just do a mental. Now, you better not write it down if somebody's close beside you, but I'd like for you a, a number between one and 10. How would you rate your relationships? Overall, would you say your relationships are, it's, it's 10, okay? Or you'd say, boy, not mine. Mine are about negative two. Okay. Uh, but what are, your, what are your relationships? How would you rate yourself? Now, typically, typically, because most of us are connected to many people, we'd say, well, which one? Or which ones? Okay. Some of them might uh, certainly would be higher than others. We have friends that are closer, but I'm not necessarily talking about depth. I'm talking about quality. So how do we think about relationships? Now, you can think about that currently. Another way to think about this is, what's what's my history? Do I have a history of solid relationships? Have I been really good, close friends with somebody for years? Or am I a person that tends to go from one closeness to another? Do I have a trail of broken relationships, conflict in relationships? When we, when we think about interpersonal relationships, generally our desire is for peace. We don't want conflict. We want peace. Uh, we may want more than peace. We want love. One understanding that could break love down into many, uh, many words there, many uh, divisions or indications of love. But we're uncomfortable with conflict. When we uh, think about a subject like this, I told you um, I depend on, I rely on the Lord. And I just uh, want to assure you that I am not actually able to come to you as an authority on relationships. Now, the reality is I, I have interacted with people a lot. I'm, and I've had more, more time to do that than many of you. Okay, so I'm 71. And so it's, you know, long history in relating to a lot of people. But uh, we have God's guidance for relationships. Now we could think about we could think about our relationships on levels. We think about kind of out there is maybe on the clear outside of the circles would be a stranger. Okay, uh, it may be that today you met somebody that you've never met before, and that's a stranger. Okay, you may have a little closer. You might have a person who is a maybe an acquaintance. You've met them a number of times. You know their name, where they live. It's kind of an acquaintance. But you don't know really that much about them. Um, you come a little closer and it might be somebody that you interact with regularly. Uh, for those of you who go to school, it'd be people that you go to school with. For those of you who work, it's your people you work with. You're around them and you get to know them. You kind of know the things that you're allowed to say, things you're not allowed to say. You kind of know the, the places that you can push them a bit, okay? They learn how to push you, okay? We, we get to know each other and, and the things that we like and that we don't like, the interactions, but it may not actually be really a close relationship. It's a lot of interaction, but not necessarily close. We don't share our hearts with those people. And so we get closer, we would talk about people as friends. Okay. But even with friends, there are levels. Okay. There's some friends that are really close. We, they, we share just so much with those friends. And then others, there are, there are friends, but we, we don't share everything with them. And then of course, there is, there's uh, even closer relationship, uh, the, the relationship of marriage, uh, there's the, the intimacy there. There's also, I would say that with, with brothers and sisters in the church, God's intention that it's even more than friends. We're, we're actually at the level of committed to each other. Okay. 
And so there's, those, are, those are levels of relationships. What I want you to note here is that God has given us direction for all those levels that I talked about. He's told us how to relate to strangers. He's talked to us about how to relate to um, uh, co-workers or people that we interact with on a regular basis. He, a lot of scripture about friendship. Uh, he's got direction for uh, marriage. He's got direction for family. He's got direction for brotherhood relationships. God has directions for all of those things. And uh, I am just saying here that the, sorry, I was looking at the wrong slide. Uh, I'm, we're talking about relationships with others here, okay. Uh, Psalm 119, a beautiful verse uh, King James says, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. I have the new King James here and it says, therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. Following that? So instructions. Is God right about how we relate to strangers? Is God right about how we relate to the people we regularly interact with, our co-workers, boss and, and um, an employee. Uh, yeah, he's got directions for that. How about our friendship? Do we trust that God's direction for friendship is right? How about his directions for marriage? How about his directions for how we relate in the brotherhood? Does God know what he's talking about? And my response is, yes, here's my faith that we, I consider everything God says about every relationship to be right. And we must then turn away from every false way. I am troubled today that there is so much misinformation about relationships. And I will tell you what seems to me, I I'm, don't know if I'm wise enough for you to just completely believe this, so if it's not right, it's okay, you can reject it. But it seems to me that one of the biggest threats today to our relationships is this individualism, this thing of I do my own thing, I have my own understanding, and you have to respect how I think about things, and I'll respect you, but you have to respect my, my way of thinking, and I, I, choose, I choose how I live, and you have to accommodate that. And, and I, my life goal is to fulfill my dreams. This, this whole individualistic way of thinking, folks, it kills relationships. And it's, it won't enable us to live well. The, it's the reason that so many marriages just uh, don't last. It, people live their own, uh, their own way of, of how they think about things. I, I listened to a man uh, years ago. It was a, it was a radio program. Uh, interviewing an author. He had written a book. I don't know what the title of the book was. It's a long time ago. It was a Canadian author. So it's, it's north of the border, all right? But this Canadian author, his, his thesis, I still remember, his thesis was this. You do what you feel is right for you and you don't compromise for anybody. That was, that was the thesis of his book. And so they were interviewing him and, and the interviewer said, well, okay, are you married? He said, no, and so the guy chuckled a bit and he said, well, do you ever date? He said, uh, yeah, he said, I, I date. Uh, and he said, so what if you were going out with somebody and uh, you wanted steak and she wanted chicken, wh where would you go? He said, well, I'd go where they have steak and chicken. He said, no, no, he said, you got it. If you had to choose between the two, oh, no question, I'd go where they have steak. She wants to come along, that's good. And you ladies like to be married to a guy like that? individualism. Don't compromise for others. God's ways, what I want to say here, folks, is that the world presses their understanding about these things upon us. They press it upon us in social media. They press it upon us in music. It's, it's what you do for me that, that matters. God's ways are right. Let's look at another relationship, my relationship with myself. I don't know if this is really uh, good <laughs> uh, to think about this because I'm one person, not two, most of the time. So, uh, do I have a relationship with myself? My question to you is, are you getting along with yourself? 
The, the reality is that most of us at times have inner battles, inner tensions, inner conflicts. And sometimes it's between what we want and we know we probably shouldn't, but we want it. And then we hear maybe even God's spirit or we might hear a brother or sister saying this to us. And we've got this tension inside because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That's one of the reasons for inner tension, inner conflict. Are we getting along with ourselves? Now here's the thing, folks. Many interpersonal conflicts are the spill out of inner tensions that are unresolved. I just uh, recently taught a class there at Faith Builders on understanding abuse. And I wonder how many times I have heard or read where children talk about, after they get older, they talk about when they were at home, they always were on edge to know what dad would be like when he came home. Okay, the, the abuse that they were receiving at home was not primarily about them. It was about the inner tensions, unresolved tensions in dad. Okay, the children got the spill out of that. So in many ways, our struggle with our struggles within, we, we also want peace inside. But our struggles within, if they're not resolved, they're going to feed into our relationships, our interpersonal relationships. And one of the things that has to happen for us in order to have healthy interpersonal relationships is to be at peace in ourselves. Now, I'm going to say something here that wouldn't be true if I'm not going to say something more, okay? But inner peace is more important than interpersonal peace. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say that, but it's, it's true only in a certain context. It's not true without that context. Okay, so we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Let me just switch this a little bit. There are times when, for some people, interpersonal peace is easier than inner peace. Uh, all I'm saying here is that there are people, we, we learn many times to, to live with masks. We've got, we've got lots of inner tensions, but we, look, we act nice. Okay, we cover it. We, we're, we're nice. Now, it might come out, it might erupt certain times, but, but we're getting along, basically getting along. And I've, I've seen this numerous times where people are shocked when somebody commits suicide because they seemed like they were fine. I read this uh, years ago. A uh, young girl in school, high school, her, her friends were just completely shocked. I read it, read it in the newspaper. They, they were just shocked. She had committed suicide the night before. She had actually poured gasoline, a terrible way to commit suicide, poured gasoline over her, uh, drenched herself in gasoline and lit herself on fire and she died. What they said repeatedly was, this girl was a popular girl. I don't remember just what all she was doing in school, but she was on um, uh, particular uh, teams or um, committees or whatever, but she, she, was a, she was a liked student. And all you can say is that, is that behind those interactions on the surface, there was incredible conflict within, unresolved conflict. So this is, this is a part of my relationship with myself, but let's go to the next one, my relationship with God. And here we come to the most significant, the most foundational relationship. I know that I'm, I'm talking to people who've grown up in church and uh, may not be saying anything new to you, but I want to just park here for a little bit and talk about our relationship with God. <clears throat> this is the context for us, being, for us to be able to say that our inner peace, it's inner peace, <clears throat> inner peace that is built upon peace with God that is more important than interpersonal peace. Is that making sense? So, 
one of the ways to think about this is, was Jesus ever in conflict with people? Yeah. He died, actually, in this terrible tension. He didn't get along with everybody. Did Jesus ever struggle with internally? Now, we might have to pause to <clears throat> think about that a little bit. Uh, because I said that one of the tensions is a tension between flesh and spirit. But even Jesus struggled with the difficulty of doing the Father's will. In the garden, he, he sweated. He, he prayed earnestly. He was struggling. How did Jesus think about resolving interpersonal conflicts? How did he think about resolving his inner conflicts? It came back to his relationship with his father. And the same thing we are called to. Paul writes to the Colossians, let the peace of God rule in your heart. The Greek word translated there, rule, is actually a word that means to be the arbitrator, to, to, to be the one that makes the decisive decision, the, the, the call. It's like the referee or the umpire. It's let the peace of God make the call. Jesus did that. How did he resolve that inner tension? He said, Father, let this cup pass from me. He was struggling, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. He, Jesus maintained his peace with his father and let that be the premise on which he resolved this inner conflict. When it had to do with the conflict with others, Jesus did not enjoy conflict, but Jesus was willing to engage with unbelievers and with self-righteous people who were in conflict, he was willing to engage with them, but he kept his peace with his father. That, that was the premise. He did not compromise that peace in order to have interpersonal peace. <clears throat> so, what does God want in relationship with us? I don't know. Here is a place where I have to rely on God's Holy Spirit to say things to our hearts that he wants to say. I don't know your hearts. I don't know your relationship with God. I don't know where you are there. Sometimes we're struggling because of events in our lives, things that happen. Sometimes we go through what seems like dry times. It just seems like we're trying to reach out to God, and we're, but we're not hearing from him. Uh, there are other times when we simply are neglecting God. We are too busy for God. And what happens then is that our heart, it affects our hearts. Folks, the only way to live, the, the only way to, to, what did we sing tonight? Transformed by grace divine. The only way to have transformed hearts, the only way to avoid being conformed to the pressures around you is to come into the presence of God regularly. It's that, it's that, um, that relationship with him that is life-giving and life-changing. It is what transforms us. There is nothing that will shape you more like God wants you to be than being in his presence. And I'd like to... Uh, answer this question from scripture. What does God want in relationship with me? God wants me, first of all, to love him. I'm sure if you folks would be bold enough and I ask you here, what is the greatest commandment? You could quote it, right? Jesus in Matthew 22, and I'm going to actually read a number of verses there now. I've mostly been quoting so far. Matthew 22 I want you to, to understand the context here. Verse Chapter 22 records numerous um, tensions that Jesus was having between he and the, the religious uh, leaders. And so you need to hear this in the context of conflict. Now Jesus is not aggravating, well... <laughs> He's not intentionally aggravating them, but they are, they are they're pounding him with questions to try to get him to say something so they can accuse him. That's the setting in this chapter. It's numerous times. We come down to verse 34. 
And it's after a conflict with the, with the Pharisee or the Sadducees. So verse 34, Matthew 22. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. I am reading in the New King James. I noticed you were reading in the King James. Is it all right if I read New King James? Sorry, I put you on the spot there, Lyle. Um, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So that's the question. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. What does God want in relationship with us? Jesus answers it very clearly here. The Father wants us to love him more than anything or anyone else. He wants it to be a relationship of love. Now, Love, has, love is broad. Love has lots of sub-meanings. I do think that there are different kinds of love. Uh, even the scriptures, we don't get it quite so much in the English translation, but the Greek language, they do use different words to, that are translated love. Okay? But love... Here Jesus is saying that this is to be the greatest. This is the first and great commandment to love God with all our heart. Now we just came past Valentine's Day. And if you men told your wife, I love you with all your heart, bless you. But it isn't scriptural. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying we're nowhere told to love people with all our heart. We are told to love God with all our heart. Okay, and I'm, I, don't worry, I tell my wife that, and I'm sure God's going to forgive you if you did it, okay? Uh, my point here, however, is that much as we may love our wife, we love God. Jesus says, even your own wife has to take second place. If you don't, he uses stronger language, you don't hate father, mother, and sister, and brother, and wife, and, and your own life. You can't be my disciple. God wants us to love him. I'm just saying here, folks, that means that it is the highest of all loves. There's no other, there is no commitment. I love my wife. I have loved her for, um, what is it, Barbara, 51 years now. And, but I never actually went to her on my knees, uh, even when I proposed, okay? There is a devotion that we have, there's a reverence, there is a height, there's a height and depth to our love for God that is unique. There is no other love like it. We are to love him with all our heart. We're committed to him even if a wife forsakes, even if child or parent or friend forsakes us or betrays us. We love God with all our heart. We that's our highest love. He wants this from us more than anything else. If I could try to put this in perspective, really folks, we, we live our short lives here, what, 70 years or 80 years? Uh, what did Moses say? If by reason of strength, it's 80 years. Some of you might be beyond that. But it's a short time. If I understand what Jesus is saying is, if you don't get anything else done in life, be sure that you do this. And I'm saying, folks, that even conservative Anabaptists sometimes are too busy to really love God with all their heart. I'm not trying to put you on guilt trips, but I am saying, folks, we need to carve out space. Any love relationship takes time. It takes interaction together. It takes communication. It takes talking. It takes listening. It takes... And so we are people, we have to be people who make space for this primary, this first of all relationship. If, if we're going to have any kind of peace, if we're going to experience the transformation into the likeness of Jesus, there is nothing that will shape us like time with God, like, like carving that out and saying, if I don't get the rest of the work done, I'm still going to do this. Now, if you've had a day where you've, you really... Uh, 
haven't had time to read your Bible, that I'm not saying that you're going to have a terrible day. There are some people that say, if you don't read your Bible, you're going to have a bad day. And I'm not saying that here. I am saying, though, that every day needs to be fellowship with God. Some of you mothers are really busy, okay? I heard a really wise preacher one time talking about this. And he said, mothers sometimes have to refuel in flight, okay? That's okay. But it still is an issue, it still is an issue of our hearts turned toward him. We want time with him. And where we can, we take time. Spending time with God. He wants us to love him. Secondly, God wants us to know him. And these two are certainly related. In fact, I will say that you can't love anyone, God included, any more than you know that person or know God. Okay, our, our love for God actually is dependent upon our acquaintance with him. Now, I told you I love my wife. Okay, we've been married for, for 51 years. And th- I don't know how to describe this other than to say that we loved each other when we got married. We have loved each other through the years, but the depth of relationship has increased through the years because we've learned to know each other and work through things and we're committed to each other. And the love deepens because of that ongoing depth of acquaintance. So acquaintance is necessary. Learning to know him. Um, how, how do we learn to know? We learn to, again, we learn to know, we deepen in our love by interaction, by fellowship, by, by actually regularly interacting. Uh, do you folks know me? Uh, now, again, Lyle and Cammie, probably the ones that have interacted most recently. Uh, John, we've interacted over the years, and some of you others, uh, we, I've known uh, Tony from Plain City. So if, if somebody would ask you, do you know John Koblenz? Those of you that I named would probably say, yeah, I know him. But uh, if, uh, Lyle, what are my favorite potatoes? <laughs> Sorry, that, that's all right. Okay. What am I like first thing in the morning? <laughs> Please don't answer if you uh, actually know. Okay. <laughs> if you'd ask Barbara, she can answer those questions because she lives with me. She interacts with me regularly. And I'm saying knowledge, acquaintance. We have to have time with God. It's acquaintance. It's, and part of, the, part of the value of reading the scriptures, I want to say again, in an individualistic, and uh, mm, there are terms for this. I can't even pull them back right now. But we're, we're in a feely culture. We have to feel things. And we'll read our Bible sometimes and we're reading a chapter and we're just kind of desperate. Lord, please talk to me here. And we read the whole chapter and it didn't talk to us. Nothing really sparkled and the lights didn't come on. And so we say, boy, you know, it didn't do me much good. And we think and going to the scriptures primarily about just getting something for me. And, and just so that I can kind of survive the day. Folks, this is an opportunity. We read the scriptures to learn to know somebody. Okay, And it's not all exciting. Some of our conversation in our homes with the people we love the most in, in earthly relationships are not all that exciting, but we spend time together and we interact with each other because we love each other. And reading the scriptures is more about us learning to know the heart of God. It's one of the reasons it's good for us to read through the scriptures, not just uh, here and there, pick something and hope that we get something that'll get us going for the day. But we read because we want to learn to know the God of the Bible, the God who created everything, the God who delivered his people, who called the people and delivered them. A God who through the Old Testament, by the way, people get wrong-headed understandings about the Old Testament because they read only certain stories. If you read through the Old Testament, you will find an incredibly merciful God. You know, I just heard it the other day. Somebody said I had an Old Testament concept about God. And I almost corrected them, but I didn't because they were sharing in a, in a very personal way. And Yes, there are scenes of judgment in the Old Testament, but you read the story and folks, God warned his people and warned his people and put up with things again and again and again. And he didn't bring the judgment. He waited. He waited centuries actually before he brought on them the consequences. He pled with them with his prophets. He sent and they were incredibly 
creative in the way that they talk to God's people. I mean, they threw their clothes off sometimes, threw them in the river. They did uh, weird things to try to get their te- the people's attention. I'm just saying that God is a merciful God. He's long-suffering. He does not enjoy punishing. He does not enjoy bringing consequences on people. We learn to know the God of the Bible. Is, it's, it's, it's important. It's, it's life-giving. And we learn to know him. And then he sent his son After all those centuries, he sent his son when the fullness of time had come and we learned to know this kind of God. God wants us to know him. God also, oh, by the way, um, knowing God. First John, there we are. Let's tie, let's first of all tie these two together. What did Jesus say in John 14? If you love me, what did he say? Keep my commandments. Okay. In John, he talks about, about uh, 1 John, he talks about, hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Again, so that's another thing that God wants from us and it's linked to the other two. Okay. So we, we obey God because we love him. We're in this love relationship. Now, I should have said here, when we talk about loving God, I want to say here, it's, it's not the love of equals. Okay? That's why it's different from a man-woman relationship, a marriage relationship. We are, this is a love of the creature for the creator. It's the love of the redeemed for the redeemer. It, it, it's a love for one who is above us, who is beyond us, and he has chosen to love us. And so even our obedience is rooted in that love. We, we love. we obey him because we love him. But it's right for him to command us because he's God. It's the nature of God. In fact, on this issue of love, you know, God says, thou shalt love. This, it's a command. And I've wondered sometimes, why would God put love in command form? I mean, wouldn't it be better just if he'd be nice so that we could love him? Sorry, my tongue is really in my cheek, if you, if you know what I'm saying there. I mean, he is nice. He is so good. He's constantly giving us good things. But my point here is that God speaks to us as God. He commands us to love, to help us remember that it's God speaking to his creation. And we come to him on our knees. We come to him in reverence. We come to him recognizing this is a being above all other beings and calls for a love above all other loves. So we show our love for him by obeying. It's actually higher than our love on the human level. Now, my wife doesn't command me most of the time. Um, but in a love relationship, even on this level, she doesn't have to. Okay? If I get an inkling, if I learn to know things that she really likes, that's what I want to do because I love her. You hear the tie between our love and our actions. And so it is with God. We love him. We delight to please him, to do his will. He doesn't even have to command us. But it's fine that he does because it it establishes that he is God. But it's out of that, out of that recognition of who he is. And so he wants us to obey him. Uh, There is a scripture that I missed here, and I want to pull it back into focus. When I said God wants us to know him, the night before Jesus died, gave his life, he prayed. Remember the prayer that he prayed there. John 17, in verse 3, Jesus says, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's life, it's eternal life. It's life giving to know God. So he wants us to love him, to know him, to obey him. I've talked a little bit about relationships, interpersonal relationships. But if you don't remember anything from this series, Except the call to love God, to know him. You have this yearning to know him and you obey him. If, if that's all that you remember, I am saying it will do more for your interpersonal relationships than anything else. 
it's that you're, it's that relationship with him, that yearning for him that actually softens our heart, that makes us humble and, and honest and open with each other. It gives us the freedom, it, the care, the love for each other. And so lo, learn to love him, to know him, to obey him. I'm going to pray yet. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you here this evening. Thank you for this gathering of your sons and daughters. I'm praying in Jesus' name that you would move our hearts towards you. Enable us, Lord. Forgive us where we allow you to be crowded out of our lives. Teach us that you are our life. Lord, uh, just uh, move on us by your spirit. We trust you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.